Thanks very much, Helen, and thanks for the uh, invitation. It's always a privilege uh, to uh, be asked to give a talk. Um, I've been giving a whole host of talks in the last 12 months on the role of magma and salt. And this is probably the last of those talks that I've given. Uh, it's nearly 21, or this, this is the 21st talk on this topic this year. So I like to give different talks every time, uh, and I'll do my best during this talk to try and cover some of the previous material um, so that uh, everybody can sort of follow the whole thing. So let's uh, start. For those of you who know me will know this has become a little bit of an obsession for me, the search for, for Oxiana, the search for um, uh, Norilsk style systems. And that's really what I wanna to talk today. And I just wanna start by connecting Alexander the Great and in fact, Marco Polo, uh, who are involved in the search for the Fountain of Youth and uh, nickel sulfides. It seems like a long bow, but trust me, I'll bring this around by the time we close out 45 minutes. This is extremely relevant. In fact, Alexander was looking for the same thing uh, that I am. I sort of want to start by clarifying uh, the different types of orthomagmatic nickel copper PG space. And this is a, a figure borrowed from Tony Naldrett looking at nickel sulfide systems in nickel copper PG space. It's actually really important to understand that the end members of these systems are vastly different to each other. And we quite often summarize them as being uh, nickel copper PG deposits, but that's overlooking a significant difference between them. So if I turn on a, a, a pointer here and we have a look, we are aware of most of the nickel sulfide systems or the nickel deposits. It's a bunch of names sitting in there. The reef style PG deposits around the PG end member and increasingly we're aware of a whole collection of magmatic uh, copper deposits. These, uh, what I really want to talk about today are not what we would call nickel deposits, but what we would call polymetallic systems. These are systems that are, uh, have large components of nickel, copper and PGEs, but where the primary metal itself is not uh, nickel sulfides. And the prime example of that would be the Norilsk system. And the example I put in here is Octobriski. Now, this is a continuum of deposit styles, but what I really want to draw attention to is the significant differences in the polymetallic systems. Significance in terms of genetic processes and significance in terms of value. These are the big granddaddies of the world. These are the trillion dollar systems. This is the sort of deposits I'm talking about. Um, uh, this sort of photo here could be taken from any of these polymetallic systems and some of you from other deposit styles will immediately recognize a dominance of chalcopyrite and magnetite, potentially looking at something that's an iron oxide copper gold. But in fact, this is a polymetallic nickel system, greater than a million nickel tons, greater than 5 million copper tons. These are giant systems. They really are the biggest deposit styles that we chase anywhere in the world. So I've got a very simple premise that I want to go through today. Nickel deposits are not the aim of this talk. I don't want to talk about deposits that have copper with a credit like Nova and Julimar. I'm really talking about a discrete deposit style called polymetallic. Yes, it's a continuum, um, but this isn't semantics. It's straight dollar values, and it's a collection of different source and different trap processes. So yes, it's a continuum, but it's the end members that we need to understand. Why do we care? Well, from an ore genetic point of view, that's one value. The second one is these are what I call the trillion dollar deposits. The real is an in situ value of over a trillion dollars. Uh, and that's quite simply the largest, uh, highest value deposit of any type uh, in the world. So the only deposits in the ballpark are Olympic Dam and Escondida. My premise and what I hope to take you through today is that they are overlooked and they are in plain sight so one of the things that people immediately assume from my opening story about uh, the search of the Palmiers 
in the stands is that they're remote. That's not the case. Uh, they are easily overlooked and there are many examples of us walking over these deposits and not recognizing the significance of them. Most people are aware of why nickel and battery metals are in uh, everybody's view at the moment in terms of the future of electrification. But actually, irrespective of the role of nickel, nickel copper PG deposits have always been the premier deposit style to focus on. It's simply grade and size. It's very interesting and perhaps very frustrating to be a nickel geologist and have people only focused on these deposits during nickel burns, when in fact they're economic throughout cycles, always have been and always will be. An important thing to realize is not only do they have the grades that we might see that are high, but they also have large size. So Nurils, for example, it is the fifth largest copper deposit in the world, the second largest uh, nickel deposit and the largest palladium system individually without the, combining the metals. One way to put the importance of the economics of these systems is this is a deposit style where we're, our mining depth is actually way deeper than our ability to explore. So unlike some other deposit styles, the limitation here is not mining, it's actually exploration search space. We are fundamentally limited in our ability to explore these deposits at depth. We can mine them to far greater depths than we're capable of exploring. And that is very different to, for example, porphyries on sediment hosted copper, whatever deposit you want to look at. I always believe in understanding past histories. I think it helps frame uh, exploration strategies. This is a bit of an outdated figure from myself and Richard Shoddy. They're looking at the timeline of discoveries of the giant systems. It's a little outdated. It doesn't include Julemar, but Julemar would be a small blip on this figure. The last uh, significant deposit really added is Sakati and Zairamu. I really want to draw your attention to three systems, Jinchuan, Nareels, Talnak, Karalak, or Oktobriski, uh, which is the Nareels camp, which we'll come back. The reason I've separated them out is Nareelsk is actually a very small deposit, uh, and that is fundamental importance to the story. And then Sakati, which is actually a significant uh, moment in the history of these systems, albeit not a giant. The important thing to understand about these discovery histories for today's talk is just simply the first intersections in these three systems is only into copper sulfides. I want to keep that in the front of your mind as we go through the talk because that's particularly interesting. It's totally logical, but in fact, it's really important to understanding why these systems are overlooked. One of the things that's really important from that history is to understand clustering relationships. So in this, because it has huge strategic implications, the short answer is your exploration strategy for polymetallic or nickel systems even should look vastly different to other deposit styles. So example on the left is the Andean porphyry system here. There are 65 deposits. This is without, without breaking this out into say Eocene Ligocene belt or the Miocene belt. And there's 65 deposits and 600 million copper tons. Same scale on the right is the Siberian traps, the same equivalent province in a nickel copper system. And there are two deposits and 100 million copper tons. So the first thing you can see is there's fundamentally different clustering relationships. Huge province clustered across the belt province and at the deposit scale in porphyries and not the case in nickel sulfides. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means first mover is fundamentally more important in nickel sulfides. And the way that most nickel geologists would describe that is second mover is first loser. And that is obviously very different to porphyry exploration. Another way of putting this, which is really opening and being way more positive, would be to say, we actually know where most of the world's porphyry provinces are. But how's this? We find 10 larger provinces than the Siberian traps, so the equivalent of the Andes, every decade. That's one per year. That seems remarkable. A porphyry geologist, imagine the concept of finding a new Andean province every year. But that is the world that nickel geologists are used to. And of course, that's fundamentally different to uh, other deposit styles. Most large of these provinces are hidden in the rock record. They are not obvious, and we have to uh, do lots of work to find them. So I've made a very bold claim that we're overlooking polymetallic deposits. 
a lot of people would say, hey, surely they've still got an EM response. Surely we still find them. So let me try and back up the claim as to why we're overlooking these systems. Nickel sulfides form and cluster at what we call camp scale or what the Russians call ore junctions. These are three-dimensional uh, intrusive clusters that have quite an extensive depth at limited strike length. In fact, very limited. They're inside provinces that are huge, but they are in fact more like central complexes. Let's look at the history of something like Norilsk. Very, very importantly is Norilsk is nearly 300,000 metal tons. It's a good deal smaller and less economic than something like Nova, for example, here in WA. Was Norilsk economic is a rhetorical question. If it wasn't in a command Soviet state, I don't think it was. And without the discovery of Norilsk, there is no discovery of Talnak and there is no discovery of Oktobriski. This is the ultimate bad story, better at depth story of multiple years of exploration to find Talnak and then the discovery of Oktobriski of extreme relevance today from not just an ore genetic perspective, but from a practical exploration targeting perspective is that different search spaces are, are present and different exploration toolboxes are not only required, but are used in the discovery of Norilsk to Talnak to Oktobriski. And this is a story I'll come back to when we start looking at erosion level in these systems. Norilsk is found first because it's at the erosional level. Oktobriski is found last because it's deep, relatively speaking. And importantly to keep in mind, blind in magnetics, gravity, and EM. That will be relevant as we come back, as I explain my way out of this hole. So how did Norilsk started? Uh, 20 million tons at 0.4, command state, gulag dominated system. The example on the right is taken from, from Steve Barnes. My earlier calculations around $1 trillion. Steve's recent uh, work suggests it's about $1.4 trillion in situ value, US 2020. Real important point about this is that it's 40 years between two discoveries. That is way too long for the, for the modern world. And we simply need to get better to be able to make these sorts of discoveries. Important thing to remember, the initial discovery is relatively poor. Um, uh, in terms of, of economics. So the first thing we'll look at in terms of why we overlook them is erosional level. It's an important thing to realize, but I don't think everybody's on board with the concept that the present geological surface is an accident of geography. Just a wonderful quote from Haddon King. So yes, we can find beautiful gossons like this, it's really easy, but this is a surface that's largely eroded and that's really an important concept. So let's flick through an example. This is Discovery Hill at Voices Bay. Most of the system is present down to one and a half kilometers of depth. Now, clearly that's not an economics that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the actual geology of the system. It's got great depth extent. Most of the sulfides are present at non-exploration, uh, easy exploration uh, surfaces of depth. But then we can get to a deposit like this, which is Jinchuan where we now think most of the deposit is actually missing from the rock record. It's mostly eroded away. We're looking at the remnants of what was an enormous system. And that's important now that we put erosional depth into our nickel sulfide models when we start trying to recognize systems that are at poor erosional levels, i.e. above where we would usually target in the systems. Much like we work in porphyries, which have a classic genetic relationship to the surface, Nickel sulfide systems also have a depth extent, and it's very easy to just miss them. In fact, if the ovoided Voices Bay was perhaps another 100 metres more uh, further eroded, wouldn't, we wouldn't have found it. But if it was also 100 metres further deeper, we would never have found it. These are very fine lines between discovery of world-class systems and completely missing systems. Now let's have a look back at, at Norilsk and just uh, imagine for a few seconds what erosional depth does. So I'll have a look at this example here. This is Norilsk within this map of the Siberian traps. This is the Talnak system. We tend to talk about these two systems because it's where the ore bodies are. But the very next discovery after Norilsk is here at Amanda in uh, the easternmost portion of the ore junctions. 
The sad thing about a manga is it looks and smells like Norilsk, but it's actually right at the erosional level. So it's uneconomic. Most of it is actually gone. Norilsk sits right at the round perfect open pit depth and Talnak is under thin cover and Oktobriski is under 400 meters of cover. Then we go to the north to Timursky here. We're at 2.5 kilometers deep. We're still hitting thick, massive sulfide. And you realize that Timursky is another world-class system, albeit too depth for the current mining search space. And you start to realize that, that search space and our ability to target these things is heavily impacted by erosional depth. Next thing to throw in, the Siberian Trex extends for about 5,000 kilometers, but the perspective part of it is 10 kilometers wide. That is an incredibly intimidatingly small footprint. Just think about that for the same. It's exactly the same for the Central Atlantic province, which is the world's largest large English province. This is a horrible word, by the way, if you want to describe the largest large. Um, if anybody can help me with terminology, that would help. What you need to realize is that for 5,000 kilometers, all you are is in a sea of monotony inside these large igneous provinces. Most things are boring, but we've got these very thin windows. And that's important when we're looking in the rock record. The vast majority of lips are not what we're looking for. But nonetheless, that's what dominates the rock record. Why else could we be overlooking these things? I think we're dominated in mafic hosted systems by models that aren't no, not relevant to, or sorry, that are not relevant to mafic systems. We're fascinated by sulfur saturation having to be formed by sulfides, but I would argue we have a multitude of options in the drive magmas to sulfur saturation. Starting with just pure silica in the example on the left here uh, with beautiful uh, uh, quartz bearing aroxonite uh, with lovely blue quartz. An example taken from, uh, from Valentina and Steve's work uh, here from Nova with beautiful mirrolytic cavities with carbonate in them. The picture I showed at the beginning of sulfates, in this case, anhydrite at Norilsk, which is still sulfur, you would argue. And then the more classical example of sulfuric sediments here from Pechenga on the right. I would argue the fifth variable in here, perhaps the most important one, is in fact a reductant. And we'll come back to that at a later point uh, when, we, when we address oxygen fugacity in these systems carbon being, I think, the essential element in every single system. What we end up with is uh, rock types that are really important, chaotic. A picture from Nova here, underground here of absolutely chaotic, heterogeneous, heterogeneous varied, what the Russians call taxitic rocks, in this case, sulfides, very, very highly disequilibrium bearing rocks. Another word for those who are not necessarily igneous petrologists, these are extremely unhappy systems. We've been documenting these for 20 years, but I think some real recent advances have made a big difference. And I'll go through to that. So what I think has happened is that we've moved from visual estimates. This is an example from Gunini in Namibia of logging beautiful taxitic rocks. We also see these style of rocks underneath the uh, footprints of porphyries, down in the couplers of porphyries. It's not a unique texture. Um, volatile, magma mingling, highly disequilibrium uh, bearing systems. But we've been able to now, I think, go to the micro scale, and this is really being led by um, the CSRO group, um, both into the tornado and uh, Meyer and synchrotron work. But I think the real big step is actually converting this to the macro scale. And uh, this is a great presentation recently given by Ben Cave, um, which is really looking at NOVA in long wavelength infrared. And the really amazing part about this work is it takes the micro scale and really scales it up so that it truly really has predictive capability. So for the first time, we've moved from, I think, pure economic geology to exploration driven insights around rocks like taxites uh, and, uh, and sulfur and assimilation, for example. And, and I'll come back to this. So I think we're finally connecting the science uh, of economic geology with the sciences of exploration geoscience. People like me uh, love to tell economic geologists as somebody who uh, thinks they're a practitioner, academic and industry practitioner um, at the same time, and sometimes is in the worst of both worlds. Uh, 
trying to make things that are not just derived science, but actually try to connecting microscale accuracy to address previously intractable problems. So we're trying to develop things that only exist at a larger scale. So it's not the same thing as just applied science. It's really trying to address these things. So I think we've moved from process to now pathways into vectors or by moving across from uh, highly accurate or greater accuracy, should I say, microscale techniques through to now core imagery. And, uh, and so we need to acknowledge the whole role of the whole process all the way through here. And this is a, a lovely picture from Steve and Valentina. And I, I just put a paper from Valentina Taranovich uh, there in the top right for anybody who wants to follow up references for the style of work. We could have put just about any Steve Barnes paper in there as well. Uh, beautiful stuff. Um, the other reason, so we're starting to scale up the things that we think are important that have been dominating academic literature for 20 years. Um, another one is just to draw on myths for a second. Uh, this is something that I, I, that I, I rant about, I would suggest constantly. And uh, the reason I rant about it is because it's very frustrating. Um, so I'll do my best. This is a presentation I gave a few years ago at a geophysics conference. Um, for anybody who's interested in, in a longer winded version, but most nickel sulfide systems are not hosted in olivine bearing peridotites. They're not hosted in ultramafic rocks. Um, that's really, really important because I think that is the dominant myth that, that exists. And in fact, if there's no ultramafic rocks and we're dealing with peroxinites or, or gabbros, there's no secondary magnetite, there's no magnetic contrast and the systems are blind in magnetics. So something that is a fact becomes uh, of exploration derivative importance. It's so only 60% of the world's nickel sulfide systems, uh, sorry, 60% of them have no magnetic signature at all. Uh, that's a very large number for a myth. And that's why it's quite frustrating because uh, what we're doing is settling for those things we can see rather than for exploring it. This is part of my logic for why I think it's a problem. A uh, very high percentage of Kamadia hosted nickel sulfides, for very obvious reasons, have a magnetic signature. They're hosted in ultramafics with secondary magnetite. And so the way I like to put this is those of us who have a Kamadia exploration background, and that includes myself, I have to unlearn this bias before we learn new information. It's a significant impediment in our industry for targeting that we don't understand the role of early petrophysics. And uh, I'd say I'm, I'm largely ignored in this. So if someone can explain why, why I'm ignored, I'd love to hear. The next thing in terms of why we overlook these systems relates to the concept of sulfide fractionation here. So sulfide liquid droplet uh, up close in here, you can see pyrotite and then pentlandite dissolving in the bottom half of this figure and chalcopyrite. So, Description here, the early form sulfide monosulfide solution, intermediate sulfide solution, the copper end member separating out. Beautiful little microcosm of what I want to talk about. And these are well-documented many places by the literature. Important thing to realize is this little microcosm gives you an idea of thick zone sulfide fractionated systems. And the tops of these systems are dominated by copper rich sulfides. A figure on the right here, again, I could take this from just about anyone. I put a paper here from Charlie Duran and Sarah Jane Barnes, who I think have done most of Sarah Jane's school on the sort of distribution of elements. And what you can recognize when you start to understand the copper rich end members is if you just walk through the elemental association, we're talking about gold, silver, copper, and a collection of incompatible elements in uh, MSS. And as a result, you end up with an elemental association that looks to the beginner's eye, nothing like a nickel sulfide system. In fact, it looks way more like a VMS, porphyry or IOCG. And I'll come back to that in a minute. It's clearly got PGs, it's clearly magmatic, but I'll show you why it doesn't necessarily look that way from an early search space point of view. So sulfide fractionation generates mineralization stalls that we walk over, have walked over, can demonstrate that we've walked over in the past. What kind of rocks do we get with them? The best description I could come up with, we get hungry gabbros, we get carbonate veins of ambiguous origin, scapolitic schists and non-magnetic serpentinites. 
and a host of minerals that I've at least never seen before. We get a whole collection of rocks that you wouldn't bother with uh, associated with the upper levels of these systems. In other words, rocks that are not salient to your average nickel sulfide geologist. So let's go back now that we realize that we've got a few things that we might look over and talk about how we can form a large polymetallic system. Because in fact, there are many elements to the system model that we have to consider, not just uh, the empirical associations that I've just given you. So let's talk about the engine. I gave a talk a month ago on how magma interacts with salt. One of the questions at the time was, you seem to be ignoring the beginning, the size of the engine, the kitchen, how the system formed in the first place. It's not true. I literally just wasn't talking about that particular part of the mineral system. I hope you, these talks are not designed to be complete overviews of everything to do with the mineral system. So let me go right back to the beginning and talk about copper and PGEs. So as most of you know, um, I'm ex-Western mining and we're brought up uh, architecture first, Lam, Graham Beggs uh, school of thought here of uh, large scale lithospheric architecture, followed by large igneous province. I've, I've evolved my own thinking over the years and I very much uh, drive this the other way around. We're starting with the large igneous province followed by lithospheric architecture. It's a long winded explanation as to why, um, but I think it's the lip that's the unknown, the, the largest unknown. And I hope I can demonstrate that. And it's especially important for polymetallic systems because source actually matters. So magma source in this case is gonna matter, not just uh, later stage tracks. So the majority of explorers actually start at the belt, but I hope to demonstrate that belts and lips are not synonymous features and that it's actually quite important and not semantics to start with existing belts. Um, I think this is a laziness that's crept in from other deposit styles, not from nickel explorers. So to a first order, the source of copper is controlled by peroxinite melting rather than peridotite in the source. The important thing to realize about these uh, silica poor peroxinites um, is A, we can turn them into a geodynamic targeting environment, but it's really, I wanna draw attention to what they do in terms of generation. They really generate really unusual melts dominated by ferropicrites, a more of a transitional alkaline character. For those of you who know your large igneous provinces, what that means is we end up with hydrous primary melts within a sea of large monotonous dry tholytic systems. Or put another way, a small amount of excitement in an otherwise sea of boredom. Um, I apologize for those of you who love their um, um, tholytic systems and their thousands of kilometers of dolerites, I'm sure somebody does. But from an exploration point of view, uh, this is uh, obviously not what we're interested in. So just to remind you of the size of the target, the size of the target is about 3 billion times smaller than the size of the whole province. It's an intimidating small zone. Excuse me. Apologize for that. Um, a really interesting thing in terms of source and area I've gone down is uh, paleogeography and, um, and, and paleoclimate. I really think this is an area of source that's really fundamental. The more and more we understand uh, about the role of salt and in particular the role of mass extinctions and using them predictably. Um, just to illustrate the importance here of how hard it is to do large in this province, I already mentioned that we get one giant Andean-like province every year. The way I like to describe that is large igneous provinces are assembled, they're not just found. Uh, it takes a lot of hard work, especially in the Precambrian. Um, most of these systems, we do not know their extent. And in fact, this includes the Paleozoic. So most of the mute, the knowledge in the last few years has been in the Paleozoic. That's how poorly we understand the world's large igneous provinces. So preservation is very poor, volumes are very poorly understand. And our ability to come somewhere like here to Zaramu, uh, which is now the world's fourth largest igneous province, is just something we just didn't know literally three years ago. 
So I've already mentioned there's a primary control on supergiant systems in terms of copper. There is in terms of PGs as well, but that's a different story for another time. So copper and PGs have very important stories. And before anybody gets their back up, there are many other derivative processes to navigate in terms of what controls copper grade or even copper tenor, the most important of which is sulfide fractionation, which I already mentioned, um, which is going to be very important in producing supergiant systems. And that's related to trap style, we'll get to that. Lots of exogenic processes. Dr. Brisky is part mafix scan system. And that's important because that's what gives it a geophysical expression because there's no uh, other geophysical expression. And so we need to consider all the variables in a, in a copper model, not just source, but literally what's our ultimate starting point and then what's the derivatives along the way. Uh, if you go back to Tony Nordritz's um, great books on nickel sulfides, you'll find ferropicrites get very little interest. When Marco and I first started uh, at Pechenga with these photomicrographs looking at titanium orgites and cursetites, and most people laughed at us as to why we were looking at ferropicrites. But of course, we had a master plan, and now the vast majority of nickel sulfide, big nickel sulfide systems are associated with ferropicrites. It's very important uh, for genetic reasons, but it's also a very easily recognizable diagnostic magma series. And the more we look, the more we find. One of the problems is the definition of ferropicrite is based on the melt itself. And obviously when we're looking at cumulates, that has to be calculated. Uh, where it's a lot easier to recognize in uh, flood basalt provinces, uh, where, we, where we're looking at uh, the melts or the magmas themselves. Um, I mentioned copper source before, just a few papers for anybody who's interested in following up um, on the Sobolov School of Thought and what that really means um, for putting this back into lithospheric architecture mapping uh, in terms of our ability to, um, to target uh, these from a, a lithospheric architecture, not just from a magma chemistry point of view. I think this is a big moment in our science because igneous geochemistry is pretty much not used. It's, it dominates academia in terms of nickel sulfides, but it's pretty much not used in industry. And that's always been a bit frustrating. Um, it's as if, but I think we'll see, going to see a renaissance in igneous petrology in industry as people start to recognize the role of uh, petrogenesis, uh, not just um, recognizing sulfide signatures. So I, I'm predicting a huge renaissance in, for igneous petrologists in industry. Um, I've been giving several talks on how magmas interact with salt. This is a screen dump from my last talk last month, because there's a host of tools on there. I, I can't go through all of that again, but what I want to do is brief, briefly reiterate some salient points. And one of them, is how magma interacts with hydrous systems, hydrous uh, evaporite sequences, and just how poor that is in the rock record. So you'll notice there's a lot of poor in my, in my talk. I'm really talking about systems are, uh, that are, have very, very poor preservation in the rock record. I see that as an opportunity, and certainly the reason why we've developed this hello systems understanding that we can combine with the mineral systems enable to us to, to generate a host of new tools from a targeting point of view, and hopefully from uh, new science as well, but definitely uh, new targeting tools. So here's a systems model here now looking at the Siberian traps. It's colored to make things just a little bit more salient, but what you can recognize here uh, over in red are the traps of the major nickel sulfide bearing systems. This is Norilsk, which is hosted uh, in the Tunguska sequence. And the underlying sequence that's described as evaporites, we've pulled out way more detail, not way more, pulled out some detail uh, in related to uh, the different types of preserved uh, salts that are present. And the important one I want to draw your attention to is the Mandorovsky formation, which as um, I allude to in a lot more detail, actually must have contained hydrous salts. And it's a fundamental cause of why Octobriski is uh, the shape it is, um, so the geometry that it is, and, and indeed why it has a, a beautiful footprint associated with it, as I'll show you in a minute. And that's because it's dominated by, or must have been dominated by hydrous salts, not just halide and then hydrite. So these are some of the tools. Um, I'll go through my other talk if you want to see the detail. Obviously, with most of the stuff, um, 
not being present in the rock record, we've had to develop new ways of looking at meta-evaporitic rocks to recognize them. They're obviously way more, so here's just one way to frame it. They're obviously way, way more uh, voluminous in the rock record than they seem. And, and that's not a stretch when you realize just how poor salt is preserved uh, in the rock record. Um, there are a number of groups looking at indicator minerals and nickel sulfides that are dominated around common rock forming minerals. But obviously we've been working for the last 10 years on developing things around salt and simply because it forms a far larger volume of the rock mass than the actual uh, intrusions themselves. So, uh, and that's been the aim of the exercise to generate the largest possible diagnostic uh, footprint that we can see. And for those of you who are active explorers, all these methods, all low cost and all the four electromagnetics, and that's an important part of strategy, uh, the, the appropriate use of, of electromagnetics. Um, one way to look at these big systems is that they represent two perfect traps. And when it comes to traps, they're both uh, nickel sulfide systems and SCARN systems. Um, SCARNs being perfect or near perfect traps. If you want to look at it like that from a, a reductant point of view. Um, and so the overlap between them not surprisingly generates the perfect storm that we want. And the beauty of this, of course, is the SCARNs provide uh, and SCARN mapping means that we can overlap new detection methodologies for nickel sulfide systems to recognize uh, as proxy for the nickel sulfide systems by combining SCARNs and nickel systems. Uh, the thing that I've really been looking for most of my career is try to take some of the science that we've been working on in academia and transfer it. And I guess I've been really inspired as all of us have by how much 3D seismic works in petroleum and it's only in recent years that I realized that 3D seismic is really unleashed sequence stratigraphy and trap geologies. It isn't itself the only story about the success of petroleum. It's really that the science itself has been enabled by a technology. And so I refer to this is that we had to chain together the fundamental blue skies and derivative economic sciences uh, with the technology itself. And so we've been looking for those similar chains in metal exploration things that leverage into larger scale technology. And I personally think we've done that in the nickel sulfide world. I think the concept of a, this chonolith, this unusual structurally predictive, you know, we can use structural geology to predict the geometries of intrusions has been a step that we now can couple with 3D seismic and large scale petrography, in particular hyperspectral technologies plus the presence of an alteration style. Remember, this is nickel sulfides we're talking about. Traditionally, there's no alteration associated with these systems, but in these large scale polymetallic systems that are overlapping with SCARNs, we do get an alteration style to add to the story. And this has enabled us to really chain together uh, science with technology. And um, so here's an image that I show many times um, over the last, 20 years of what these channelists look like, um, these in-member sausage pipe-like sill systems that are, um, you're looking end on. The important thing to realize is the scale in this picture. Remember, if the large igneous province Siberian traps is 5,000 kilometers across, this is an intimidatingly small search space. In fact, another way of looking at it is it's not present in most pre-competitive data. That is the challenge of nickel sulfide targeting. What this does, of course, with these structural controls we've been working on over the last few years has really unleashed the, these new tools. Um, very fortunate to be part of this study here. Um, hopefully Steve Rennick is on the call, a little acknowledgement to him and the IGO crew for the use of 3D seismic. First time I've ever seen 3D seismic used in nickel sulfides, I would say for this purpose and the ability to map uh, intrusions. And I, I can't show you any of the detail other than something from IGO's website here, uh, just a snapshot to really demonstrate what I think is a massive advance in predictive nickel sulfide geology, the ability to map the structurally unique intrusion styles. It's, it's more than just recognizing this intrusion style in larger scale uh, data sets. 
it's actually coupling it as well. And um, for those who don't know, I'm an extreme fanboy of a long wave infrared mapping. And this is my plug for that. Not only can we recognize uh, ultra high temperature, so UHT means ultra high temperature. For those not familiar with the, the lingo, this is a, a form of sedinidinite fasces that we see in calc silicate zone. Very unusual, very rare systems that we can recognize uh, that represent very, very high temperature uh, contact metamorphism for want of a better word. We can now map tax sites and UHT zones uh, in large data sets in 3D. And uh, just a little note down the bottom, most people confuse long wave infrared with short wave infrared. Uh, apologies if that, if that was too harsh, but um, just to point out that it, to my knowledge, there's very little long wave infrared mapping going on in the world uh, of relevance to nickel sulfide systems. Um, this work here, I think, has unleashed the decades of research from the Tony Nordrit School. The work that focuses on sediment interaction, oxygen for gasity evolution and volatiles. I think this is the key work that enables us to answer new science on the geometry of taxites, their mineral. Okay, so uh, I don't know where we, we left off. I was just talking to myself there happily. Um, I want everybody to think of the, the high-end accurate tools as really the training tools for um, long wave infrared. And I really think this is um, the so-called game changer, but I really do uh, not, uh, I'm, I'm just not gonna return to the old tools now that we've got uh, such advances. Um, moving beyond um, uh, the footprint here, exogenic footprints, um, are really the, uh, can everybody, that's still annoying. Uh, exogenic veins themselves, the important thing to realize about them is they are the first footprint that you see in these systems. So I want everybody to sort of uh, return to um, my opening slide where I talked about the polymetallic systems were what they looked like when they were first found. The first thing that was found were in fact exogenic veins and copper veins in these systems. And it's really important because in fact, this is the logical thing to find in a nickel sulfide system. Sometimes these really resemble uh, other deposit styles. This is taken from a recent paper from Steve, uh, Valentina, and myself. Um, I love this photo. It sits, uh, used to sit uh, in, the, uh, in the mine office. Um, could have stolen this from Mount Isa. This is in fact the nickel sulfide system. I've seen these deposits uh, overlooked for the thing they look most like are VMS, uh, porphyries, iron oxide, copper gold, uh, and even Mount Isa style. Um, just moving on in terms of footprint, getting bigger and bigger around the intrusion. So the intrusion is now mappable with 3D. Taxite maps and vectors can be found. These ultra high temperature UHT that I mentioned, if we, we look at some uh, Finite element modeling is where we expect to find alteration, these high, ultra high temperature metamorphism. Uh, and a map here from Tarotsev in the left of the screen, really showing you the distribution of merwinite. Merwinite is a high density calc silicate uh, present in the mantle for those of you who are igneous petrologists. And you can see the merwinite zones are developed here at Oktobriski and Komsomolsky. And they developed right over the top of uh, and spatially associated with the highest thickness of massive sulfide and highest grade of copper sulfides associated with the system and with huge exogenic footprints, huge exogenic vein footprints. Um, we've known about this ultra high temperature zonation for probably 40, 50 years. It really is the equivalent of the potassic zone in porphyries. Um, but it's, I don't think until the last few years have we realized just how easy it is to map in lithogeochemistry. Uh, in particular, a secondary footprint in hydrogeochemistry. Most of you know me, know me, I'm, and I'm a massive fan of hydro. Uh, and simply because we're making the footprint a lot larger and a lot easier to detect. And here's the real key point for me, not only is the footprint larger, but it's in the hanging wall of the systems. And therefore we hit it and drill it first as part of the discovery process. It's actually the thing that we will see on the way towards success. And this isn't wishful thinking, 
In fact, this is actually how these deposits were found. Octobriski was found by drilling the uh, ultra high temperature alteration uh, in the hangar. So was Talnak for that matter. Key part of their discovery stories. Um, here's a little bit of a picture trying to pull everything together. So we've got time for questions. Uh, the green is an outline of the intrusion coming out of the slide. Note the scale there that we're looking at. Uh, it's quite small. The red shows you the disseminated sulfides. People like Steve have been working, Barnes have been working on uh, what this disseminated sulfide halo means. We now recognize amongst that these unusual textured disequilibrium paxite rocks, uh, abundant merolytic cavities. I think we see them in most of the world systems now. Uh, and obviously we, we only knew about them 20 years ago, but now we're seeing them everywhere. This intrusion geometry, this unusual unique intrusion geometry we call tonaliths that we can now map using 3D seismic. The exogenic veins we can see in yellow in here that are a larger footprint and crucially present above the intrusions themselves. And really this enormous merwinite in contact metamorphic zone that we see in calc silicate systems, which really defines the very large footprint of these systems. So the real important thing is not only is this footprint getting larger, which is really important for such a small deposit system or small footprint system, um, but we're now starting to tie in or uh, economic geology genetic importance to these systems. So we end up with rocks that look like this, which is dominated by magmatic chalk pyrite and pyrotite. And this is taken from a polymetallic deposit. Now, this is the sort of uh, rock type that we might overlook. We would follow up, obviously, but certainly in the past, this is the sort of intersection that could easily be rejected. So why are those initial drill holes in copper sulfides important? Because that's exactly what you would expect at the tip of an iceberg of a really large system. And that's really an important concept that um, I hope is intuitively obvious um, from you know, a lot of people's work is that what we're on our way towards discovery of the main nickel sulfide system, it's the outer footprints that we should expect to need to navigate in them. And the reason why I raise this point is because I know of several examples of deposits that have been rejected at that very moment, simply because they don't resemble nickel sulfide systems. So we get rock intersections that look a little bit like this, dominated by chalcopyrite and pyrotite. Important thing to realize is visually, this could come from any number of deposit styles. You would obviously want to follow this up. Um, so there are lots of false positives from lots of other mineralizations to consider. But in fact, very quickly and very easily, a nickel sulfide geologist would tell you whether this is part of a nickel sulfide system, a larger nickel sulfide system or not. So I want to finish up um, by uh, talking about this image here and about what a whole uh, system looks like. The important thing to realize is the scale on the left-hand side. The intrusion is small. We're trying to make the footprint as big as possible. We need to get beyond directly targeting the sulfides, but actually the larger footprints associated with these systems. I think we can make this several uh, factors larger, which is really important, just to reiterate, reiterate, reiterate the larging this province is, the size is important. The Siberian Traps is 5,000 kilometers wide and the target intrusion uh, junction is only 10 kilometers and the target intrusion is only 400 meters wide. This is analogous to being a diamond explorer. It's nowhere near as bad, but it's the analogous problem. We simply have to make the footprints larger. Here's a couple of imaginary drill holes, one drilling into the Merwinite only zone uh, where we can navigate and one drilling into the upper copper scum. These are schematic, but they are actually how Octobriski was discovered using hydrogeochemistry. So my last point is really that the secondary, I'm only talking about primary footprint, the secondary footprint of these systems in hydro and the resistate indicator minerals is tens of kilometers in scale. So I think for the first time, we're unifying a story that involves a range of technologies that makes a deposit that I think is prohibitively small and just making it large enough to be able to hit with a collection of modern technologies. So by way of conclusion, from a Greenfield's point of view, 
It's all about finding new large igneous provinces. It's important not to follow everyone else. It's a poor strategy. Um, it's done because we're borrowing it from other deposit styles. Remember, we find the equivalent of a new Andean copper province in terms of size, not in terms of metal endowment, every year. That should be motivating. It shouldn't be a negative. They're very easily hidden. That means more work, economic geologists, fundamental igneous petrologists are required, geochronology. That target district in the deposit size are very small. Um, we have to use a series of techniques, both primary and secondary footprints, to make them big. Source is a key control in polymetallic systems. I think by combining and talking about nickel deposits as a group, we are dulling this, our exploration targeting capabilities. Not all lips and magmas are equal. And I really think that's an exciting area for igneous geochemists going forward. I talked a little bit today about metasalt, but it's a big area for me because I think evaporites are vastly underdone in the rock record but such a really important rock type for this deposit style. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the brownfields or deeper search space, which is really the realm of the bigger companies. But I think we need to just acknowledge how far we've come in the last few years. The science of channelist axites and ultra high temperature metamorphism, I think is chaining together technologies. I'm really excited about the work that we've done in 3D seismic and hyperspectral. I think this is the analogous moment that petroleum has had with 3D seismic and sequence stratigraphy. I really think we're going to take the work of the Tony Norbert School and we're going to chain it uh, uh, to, to our exploration science. And the last point is a bit of a opportunity. Erosional level understanding means we can now revisit deposits, prospects that are at the wrong erosional level. They're simply stranded because we can't recognize even their three-dimensional potential. And these are the acquisition targets for us for tomorrow. So I'm gonna finish up um, with just a few acknowledgements. I've given a lot of talks on this. I hope I put some references for those of you who wanna follow up with this. This talk is being recorded. I will provide the slides. Um, I just want to acknowledge three people that I think have played a really important role. They're early career researchers, uh, Ben Cave, who's at IGO, Steve Rennick, who's now at BHP Billiton, and Josh Coombs, who's now at Azure, who have driven the long wavelength and 3D seismic. These sort of people don't usually tend to get the credit that they deserve for the amount of insights that they've provided and the step change I think that we've seen in nickel sulfide targeting. And the last point to wrap everything up in a nice little bow, if it's at all possible, is that I believe people like me are searching for Oxiana. We're searching for this great deposit. The important thing to realize it's hidden in plain sight. They aren't in the remote Palmiers only of this world, but they're right under our feet. And in fact, I'll finish by telling you that Alexander the Great actually camped on a polymetallic nickel copper PG deposit on his way to search for the origin of the fountain of youth. And that's where I'll close my story. Thank you very much.